Good morning, everybody. My name is Bart Stever, and I'm the senior minister here at Parkside, and it's my privilege on most Sunday mornings to stand here and to open up God's Word and to invite you into a conversation with God through His Word. And if this is your first time being with us, we invite you into 12 conversations that we're having about what it means to be a very serious follower of Jesus Christ. And we've taken it from the very beginning as to how we come into that relationship in the first place. And then as we do, as we express our faith in Christ, as we throw ourselves on His mercy and ask forgiveness for our sins, as His Holy Spirit comes into our lives and into our our very minds as we promise to follow Him for the rest of our lives, well, then what happens? That's just the beginning. What happens after that? And these are the 12 conversations that are taking place within smaller groups of people, and I hope you're doing that. Taking, We have uh, books that are discussion guides for these 12 conversations, and more of them have come. You can get them at the Information Center today. Take one. They're free. And so you may be going through that by yourself in a devotional time, and that's good, but better is to talk with somebody about that so you can bounce off of each other, challenge each other, pray for each other as we understand what it means to be a a real, true, authentic follower of Jesus. Well, as we come into this relationship, what happens as we commit ourselves to Christ? That's just the very beginning. What happens after that? Well, Jesus said, and we... I uh, looked at this back a couple of weeks ago in a book of the Bible called John, in the 15th chapter of John. He said, as you connect with me in this relationship, there's juice <laughs> that flows, life that flows from him to us. And there are good things that are, are a result of that. He calls it fruit, just like fruit on a tree. And he talks about this in another place too. A historian who wrote the history of Jesus by the name of of Luke has uh, recorded his words, and it's in the sixth chapter of his history. And Jesus said this. These are his very words. He said, a good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. He was in the habit of saying obvious things. And so we're, we're the trees he's talking about, okay? We're the trees. A tree is identified by its fruit. That's how you tell what's going on inside this tree, whether it's healthy or not, what kind of tree it is. Well, that's true of us as followers of Jesus. Figs are never gathered from thorn bushes. Grapes aren't picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from a treasury of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So the effect of being connected with Jesus is that different things begin to flow out of us than what used to be true of us. There's good stuff that starts showing up in our lives. And it becomes who we are. It becomes our nature to be this good person that looks a lot like Jesus. That's what John said. John was one of the original followers of Jesus. You know, he picked out 12 men to be with him. John was one of those. And here's how John described the change in his life, or what should happen in our lives too. He says, the one who says he abides in him, the one who is committed to Jesus and is connected to him, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So that's what the fruit looks like that signifies that we're a follower of Jesus and that things are different now. We walk like Jesus. We act like Jesus. We we say what he would say. We're in a situation and we start to always, or for the most part, do the right thing, say the right thing, act the right way. We look like Jesus more and more. We get a heart transplant. You know, one of the really highlights, I think, of the Bengals game Thursday night, besides the fact that they won, was the feature that they did on Sam Weish, who had a heart issue. And he received a heart transplant and was given new life because of that. And they interviewed him and he was able to watch the game and it was really cool. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us. We've got a heart without him that is sick and it's weak. And there's not much chance that the good stuff, according to what God says is good, is going to be produced in our lives. 
But when we connect with Jesus, it's a new heart. It's a new day. It's a fresh start. A whole new source of God's goodness starts to come out of our lives, and it's obvious. We become new people. And that's a theme that we really like. It's a theme in, in so many movies that we really like, or maybe movies that I really like, like A Christmas Carol. You know, grumpy old Ebenezer Scrooge, bah humbug, he's down on Christmas and he's down on people. And finally his heart of stone melts and he becomes this really good, generous man. Regarding Henry, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, it's pretty good. He's this nasty, nasty man and he has this accident. I think he gets shot actually. Goes into a coma, coma wakes up, and he's a new, new and different person. He's this wonderful guy that was deep down inside somewhere. The Grinch finally gets it at the end of the cartoon. Despicable Me, one of my favorite movies. Terminator. He was such a nasty cyborg in the first Terminator. And in the second Terminator, he still creates a lot of mayhem, but he does it for all the right reasons. And he's a good cyborg in the, in the second Terminator. Even Jurassic Park, the original Jurassic Tyrannosaurus Rex, he's tromping around and he's eating people and he's just this nasty, nasty dinosaur. But in Jurassic World, you remember what happened? He goes in and, and the humans are doomed. The velociraptors are in there. Here comes T-Rex and he beats up on the velociraptors and the humans are saved. So there's hope even for T-Rex. I love movies like that. It, it just is encouraging to me. And that's what we want, isn't it? As followers of Jesus, we want to be different. We want it to be real. What, what we say has taken place in our lives. And we want Jesus to show up so that other people can see that. Well, how does it happen? How does a bad person become good? Or how does a pretty good person become so much better because now God is the center of their life? How does that happen? What happens through sculpting? I do some sculpting. I do some wood carving. And I only carve one thing. I carve Santa Clauses. That, that is my expertise. <laughs> and the way that starts out is I'll take a little block of wood and I'll draw a Santa on him and I'll take my knife and just start chipping away at that. And I never know what's going to come out because it never looks the same. Every time there's a different Santa inside that block of wood. And so sometimes people will ask me and say, well, how do you do that? I say, it's easy. All you do is chip away everything that doesn't look like a Santa. And there you go. Now, that's not an original statement with me. A lot of people who do sculpting say things like that. Michelangelo, uh, famous Renaissance artist, totally dedicated to God, very spiritual man. You see, everything that he painted or that he carved had everything to do with God. It was the way he expressed himself in worship. And he said this about his carving. He says, Every block of stone has a statue inside it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. And that is what happens when we connect with Jesus. We begin, with the help of God, we begin to chip away everything that doesn't look like Jesus until more and more his image appears in our lives. That's when this good new person is discovered. Well, Paul describes how that process works or what that process looks like, this, this sculpt, sculpting, this chipping away. He says, here's what you need to do. He says, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Now, I didn't say that our sexuality is a bad thing. That can be expressed in a, in a very good and, and godly way, but it can get twisted. And I don't think I have to explain that to you. I think we understand what that means. And Paul says we need to, we need to put that away. It shouldn't be true of us anymore. Don't be greedy. A greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of the world. Don't make the pursuit of stuff the primary focus of your life. It's a false god. It can't deliver. Stay away from that as your priority. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of these things. Get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Put it to death. Don't lie to each other. You've been stripped of your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. 
Or at least we should be in the process of stripping off all of those things, shucking those things off from our life. And as we're doing that, then put on the new nature. Be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter your gender. It doesn't matter what your status is, your social standing. Christ is all that matters. And as a follower of Christ, He is now with you and in you. And He's the one who makes all the difference in life and makes these things possible. Since God chose you to be the holy people that He loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Okay, well, that sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what we want. We want to be the person that is described there, but maybe you're thinking, maybe you're saying, it's not happening with me. I feel stalled. You know, I've I've got this past. I've got this record (laughs) that I'm dealing with, and I tend to go back to that, and that tends to be my identity of what I was. And I don't seem to be going anywhere. I don't see any movement in my life since I have become a follower of Jesus. So what am I missing? How does this happen? First thing to understand is that this is the work, the work of transformation in our lives. We take a bad person that becomes good. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. As we connect with Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in And the Holy Spirit is, He is Michelangelo. He is the one who sees what we can't see. He looks at this block of wood that is us. He says, ah, I see a saint. A saint is merely someone who is dedicated to life with God. That's somebody that God can use for His purposes. And that's what the Holy Spirit sees. Yes, it's in there. And he's the one who who brings about that change and makes it ultimately possible. It's not a do-it-yourself project. We can't do it by ourselves. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So what does he do? Exactly what does he do? Well, he gives us presence of mind, an awareness of life around us that we haven't had before. So when we get in a situation, we know what the right thing is to do where we may not have understood that before. The right thing to say, how to act, how to respond. He can pull us back from things. He gives us warning bells that go off when we're in a situation that we need to step away from. Wow, he develops a conscience. I've got a conscience that is relentless, and it's not because I'm such a good person. It's because the Holy Spirit just really takes me to task When I don't listen to him, when I don't take his lead, or when I step into something that I know is wrong, that I shouldn't have done it, oh boy, he just really, he really lets me have it. And that's a good thing. It's appropriate guilt. There is such a thing as appropriate guilt, and he can bring that about. And that moves me closer to where I need to be. But the second thing that we need to understand is that it isn't just the work of the Holy Spirit. We've got to meet him in that desire, and in that process of transformation. We can't sit there like an inert block of granite and say, okay, God, do your thing. Make, give me the makeover that I need, and I'll just, I'll just wait on you here. You know, please, God, I've got this desire that, that tortures me, this temptation that I don't seem to be able to deal with. Please take that away. Well, it doesn't work exactly like that. God, please, I'm the most impatient person in the world. Can you please just, you know, open the lid and pour in a dose of patience and make it better? It doesn't work that way. (laughs) No, we've got to meet him with things that we bring to the equation. What are those things? Faith and trust. When he speaks and when he leads and when he pushes and says, here it is, here's what you need to do right now in this situation, in faith we do it. Even though it might be scary, it might go against every inclination that we have, I don't want to do this. When we have enough faith and enough trust to say, all right, I'm, I'm going to do it, that's when he engages and says, all right, we're going to make some progress here because you've brought in faith and trust. You're, you're actually going to listen to me when I speak to you. 
makes all the difference. The other two things that we bring are serious intent and training and discipline. Oh, those are three things, aren't they? Well, training and discipline are kind of the same thing. Serious intention and discipline training. You know, there are things that we might want to do, but willpower isn't going to get us there. You might say, I would really like to run a marathon. I think next flying pig, I'm going to get up that morning and just go run me a marathon. I would really recommend you not do that. <laughs> you will hurt yourself because you've got to prepare yourself for that. You've got to go through quite a bit of discipline and training to give yourself the ability to do that. That's what a discipline is. A discipline is an activity that we involve ourselves in now, something that we can do, that as we do this thing, it slowly enables us to do something that at present we can't do. I can't run a marathon right now. But if I get up and little by little every day add a little more mileage and a little more mileage, eventually I can do it because I have trained for that. That's how godliness happens in our lives. We take on those disciplines that make things possible to become the person that Christ knows that we can be. Paul says it this way. He says, don't waste your time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, he doesn't say try to be godly. He says, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. Willpower can only take you so far. There's got to be something more that we bring to that, and it's effort that comes about through disciplines. Okay, now practically, how does this work? Okay, well, let's talk in terms of two different things. Let's talk in terms of, let's, let's get rid of this bad fruit, all right? The Apostle Paul says, these are things you need to get rid of. So how do you do that? Well, how can discipline help us to get rid of those bad things, those bad habits that aren't normal for us anymore. The way that, that I approach this in my life is I, I call it cutting yourself off of the pass. That's cowboy talk. Hanging it off of the pass, painting yourself in a corner. If there's something that I know shouldn't be a part of my life, doing something that makes it at least very difficult, if not impossible, for me to do that. Here's an example. Okay, a few years ago, we got, um, we got a big screen TV. High def, beautiful. And subscribe to DirecTV. Live in large. Well, discovered as I was playing around with this and started going through channels, there was some stuff on there that was kind of eye-popping. And it was stuff that a godly man should not be looking at. I hadn't even paid for it. I, don't even, I didn't know why it was even in there, but there it was. So I called DirecTV and I said, hey, you got, you got stuff in this package here that I didn't pay for. And they said, no, you don't. We've looked at your thing and you don't have it. I said, I'm telling you, it's there. Well, they weren't any help. So I thought, all right, so what do I do? Now, you might be thinking, ah, you're a pastor. You shouldn't be drawn to something like that. You shouldn't struggle with something like that. Well, guys, I am wired up the exact same way that you are. So yes, I have a certain amount of control in my life, and I can, I can stay away from things, but you know what? I just didn't want any chance of a weak moment for myself or for anybody else that would happen to be watching my television. I just didn't want it there. I don't need the stress. So what do I do? All right, so I took... You can set up levels on your television as to what you're allowed to view, and they will block you according to certain levels. So I put on this block. I don't want to see this kind of programming. And after you do that, then you punch in a password. So you take your remote, and what I did was I turned the remote around so I couldn't see what I was doing, and I punched in numbers that I didn't know. I had no idea what my password was. So the next time I came across a channel that says, sorry, you're not allowed to watch this, even if I was so tempted and so wanted to get in there, I couldn't. I had no idea what my password was. Actually, I set the level too far, too high, because it came up, Hobbit. No, nah, you can't watch The Hobbit. There's way too much. Okay, well, I guess I'll just have to live with that. That's what you do to paint yourself in a corner and to meet the Holy Spirit and say, you know what? I'm serious about this. I'm willing to do some things that let you know that I'm engaging with you, and I really want this change to take place in my life. 
You cut it off at the pass. And so that's what we have to do. You look at when is it in life that, or when is it time-wise that I struggle with things? Maybe it's from 11 to 5 at night in early morning. Well, cut that off at the pass. Maybe you just dedicate yourself say, I'm going to bed at 11. That's it. Nothing good happens after midnight. I'm going to bed at 11. And you do whatever it takes to ensure that that happens. You get with your spouse. You get with a friend. You, you have somebody who can support you and encourage you in that. Maybe it's a where, a place. Man, you know, when I go to the bar, nah, nothing good happens there. And I, I don't... I'm not saying going to a bar is necessarily sinful, but, I mean, why do you go to a bar? Most people go to a bar to get kind of a buzz on, don't they? Isn't that kind of the purpose behind a bar? You say, you know, I can't handle it. I can't stop where a person in moderation should stop. Well, maybe you just don't go to the bar anymore. If that's dragging you away, keeping you from what Christ is, is calling you to be. Maybe you stay away from the casino. Maybe you, and I know, I'm talking about all the stereotypical things that pastors tend to jump up and down about. You know, bars, casinos, those kinds of, of things. I got a pastor friend who had to finally get, stay away from the basketball court. Yeah, a really good guy, dynamic guy. His temper was so bad and his competitiveness was so bad, he'd get up there, he'd start throwing elbows, and he'd say, it was killing my witness. He said, I had to stay out of the gym and quit playing basketball. Couldn't handle it. So that's what we have to do. Is you look, is it a where? If it's a where, if it's a place, don't go to that place. Just cut that out of the realm of possibility. Maybe it's a, a what. There's a, there's a something. And when I am in contact with this something, it just gives me a lot of grief and causes me problems. And maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's electronics. That tends to be a big thing these days. We are so connected to everything going on in the world and, you know, we can get on and tell the world that we got a new puppy and here's how cute he is. But unfortunately, there's a, very, there's a dark side to that, isn't there? And you, we all know that. We know there's a dark side. And I, I read a couple articles this week that uh, didn't tell me anything I guess I didn't know, but it was, it was disturbing to read them. And the one was how social media has destroyed our ability to have reasonable discourse with each other. You know, in the whole political realm, things that are being said back and forth between people is just vile. And somehow we feel free to say that because it's electronic and the filters are off and we get this electric courage that saying things that we wouldn't say if we were face to face with somebody so if we read that and if we feed on that it's going to have an effect it can make us it can certainly affect our peace of mind it can affect um, the level of anger within us the inability to even talk to each other in a civil way anymore I uh, saw another uh, article that was lamenting the effect that social media is having, especially on young women, that there has been this rise in, in emotional struggles and, and mental struggles, and they tie it directly to what young women are seeing and hearing and reading and feeding on in social media because of expectations that are raised of here's what's expected of you as a female today, who you must be, what you must look like, criticisms that they receive, and on and on it goes. It can be a good thing, but it can be a devastating thing for all of us. And so what perhaps we need to do is, is say, click, I'm turning it off, and I'm putting it up, and I'm going to have a, a, a day where I'm unplugged to where I can simply allow Christ... <laughs> To, to expunge my mind and I can feed on some other things than what's out there culturally that can be so very toxic. Maybe it's electronics that we need to set aside. Maybe it's a who. Somebody that, man, this is the most fun person in the world, but with, I'm with, when I'm with them, I have way too much fun. And, and I just go places I shouldn't go. When I was in Indiana, there was, a, there was the guy, he was the funeral director at the, at the only funeral home in town where we lived in Indiana. We spent a lot of time together. I did a lot of funerals. And uh, I worked with them on their ambulance service. Sometimes they were, they were short somebody, so I'd ride along on the ambulance ride. 
Bob. His name was Bob. Bob was so much fun. I mean, he was hilarious. But he was a really bad influence on me. And I tried to be the good influence on him, and I'm not sure I made any headway. One time I told him, I said, Bob, I want to come over and talk to you about the Lord. He says, well, you better come early and stay late, because uh, that probably ain't going to happen. But I did. I went over, and yeah, we didn't, we didn't get anywhere. So I moved to Cincinnati to get away from Bob. Um, <laughs> but sometimes we have to do that. We say, this person, as much as I like and love this person, I am not strong enough to be the influencer in this relationship, and it's just, it's got to go. Well, you, you listen to all that, and you might think, I couldn't do any of that. I'm not, I'm not going to bed at 11. That's, I can't do that. I can't turn off my electronics. I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, is it I can't, or is it I won't? You know, sometimes we'd rather sit around and moan about how we're not making any progress rather than actually doing something about it and bringing something to the relationship with the Holy Spirit that he can work with. Yeah, we can do a lot of things if our greatest desire is to be remade in the likeness of Christ, which is an amazing thing when it begins to happen. All right, well, that was kind of negative. That's, you know, okay, that's getting rid of the bad stuff, the bad fruit. Well, what about adding in the good stuff? What disciplines can make that happen? Well, the one-two punch of discipline the push-ups and the arm curls of discipline are Bible reading and prayer. I know it sounds trite. You hear it all the time. But it's absolutely essential. And we don't do that just so we can get good at Bible reading and prayer. So we can check that on the list and say, well, I spent a half an hour. Now I'm spending an hour. And No, it's the goal is to become as much like Jesus as we can become. And the way that we do that is we connect with him by speaking with him often and hearing from him often through prayer and through his word. That's where the plug goes in the receptacle. That's when the juice flows between us and the Holy Spirit in a very profound way. Now, you can get good at Bible reading and prayer and, and Jesus have nothing to do with it. You know, there may not be an ounce of love in your heart. That's not the goal. The goal is to see that that is a means to not only draw closer to Christ, but to be sculpted in his image. And when Jesus went, was beginning his public ministry, what did he do? Before he was baptized and he went out into the wilderness, he spent 40 days out there alone with God, connecting with God, praying, Spending time, he didn't just spend time in the Word of God. He is the Word of God. <laughs> he had a complete grasp of the Word of God and the will of God. But at the end of that time, when he was physically very weak and Satan came to him, no problem. He was able to deal with that because he was powerful in the Word and in prayer. It's essential. We've got to have that. So what is what it going to take? What discipline do we need to incorporate in our lives to make that possible? We say, well, I want to read the Bible more. How do I do that? What's blocking you? What's the barrier that's in the way? You've got to figure out what the discipline is then that gets that barrier out of the way to make that more true of you, that you, you participate in that. Maybe it's just getting up earlier, making more time. Well, I haven't got enough time. Get up earlier. Can you get up half an hour earlier? Can you look at your schedule and look at, at uh, 45 minutes of time you waste every day doing something that really doesn't add up to much, could that be dedicated to something that is absolutely crucial in your life? Well, I haven't got enough, I don't have enough time. Yeah, you do. You got enough time for anything you want to do, for anything that moves you and motivates you. You got time. You make time for that. Very important to make time for this. You know, I'd like to be a more compassionate person. You know, as, as Paul describes this kind, gentle, merciful, compassionate person, I'd like to become a person like that. So what do you do? What's blocking you, stopping you from becoming that person? Well, maybe you need to be with, with people who are in need. You, know, you say, well, I, you know, I tend to hang out with people who are very affluent and self-sufficient. Spiritually, they're not necessarily, but physically, maybe they got it all going for them. Well, there are a lot of places where you can be with people who do have needs and they're... They're glad to admit that to you and, and receive any help you'd like to give. There's a ministry here, very much part of the heart of this church, called the Christian Outreach and Wellness Center, the outreach ministry. You can easily get involved there. Lots of different things you can do. Be with people who need 
somebody to care about them. And I guarantee you the Holy Spirit will take that and he will zoom a compassionate heart within you that you didn't know was there. Maybe you need more patience. There was a time I really needed, as a dad, needed more patience. I'd come into the house and especially, I tend to be kind of a neat person, kind of orderly. And I would look at my daughter's bedroom. I don't think she listens to my sermons online. I'm pretty sure she doesn't. But it was a wreck. I mean, we were, we were very opposite in that way. And as I go down the hallway, my bedroom, our bedroom, was down to the right, and hers was dead ahead. So I couldn't go into my bedroom without seeing her bedroom, and I just, whoa, you know, flip out. And finally, I stopped myself, and I thought, what do I want my daughter to remember about me? <laughs> in her growing up years. Well, well, Dad usually just was pretty over-agitated about my room. That was a big deal with her. That's about all I remember. thought, I don't want that to be the memory. So I need patience. How do I get that? What do I need to do? Well, I finally, I can't hit on a solution. I just won't look in there. <laughs> I'll just, when I walk down the hall, I'll just kind of, I'll go right immediately. I won't even look in there. And even if she's in her room, if I need to talk to her while she's in her room, I just, you know, I'll kind of stand here and look up or look around. And I just won't look in there. It was amazing. It was like a miracle. All of a sudden, man, I calmed down. I was so peaceful. It was great. Simple little discipline. Don't look in there. And everything calmed right down. It's those kinds of things when we look at it and say, what needs to be more true of me? What is stopping me from getting there? And what do I need to do to get that out of the way? And as we engage in that, that's something we can do to become this somebody that isn't true of us now, but it can become true as we enter into that discipline and into that training. And the Holy Spirit engages with that. He says, all right, I see you're very serious about this. You have something that you're willing to bring to this. And so as we engage with the Holy Spirit, it becomes supercharged exponentially. It becomes more effective than we would ever dream. And there's nothing more exhilarating to know that you are becoming more like Jesus in your life. There's nothing, nothing better than that. We need to see ourselves in a different mirror because we tend to look at ourselves according to what we have been or what we are at present. And Jesus has a whole different mirror that he uses than what we do because he sees the potential that's there. He sees what's down inside that can be brought to the surface as the old nature is put away and as the new nature is nurtured and given life. That's what he sees. Everybody that he associated with when he was here on earth experienced that from Jesus. He was so encouraging and so inspiring. When he met his follower, Peter, he was, he was called Simon. And when he met Simon, he said, all right, Simon, you're going to follow me and life's never going to be the same. And I'm not even going to call you Simon anymore. I'm going to call you Cephas. Or another name for that is Petras, which means rock. He said, you know what? When I look at you, I don't see an uneducated fisherman. I don't see somebody that just shoots their mouth off at, at inappropriate times. I don't see somebody who's inclined to be cowardly when the pressure's on. I see a rock. I see somebody that can be the foundation of my work here on earth and that eventually is going to have so much boldness that he's willing to give his life for me. Yeah, you're, you're not Simon. You're rock. You're rocky. Dun, dun, da, da, dun, da, da, dun. That's, that's what Jesus does when he looks at us. He sees what can be true, and that's there inside of each one of us. He looked at the Apostle Paul, whose name was Saul, and he was one of these grumpy religious guys, really grumpy. He was actually very good at Bible reading and prayer. He was an expert at Bible reading and prayer. He didn't have an ounce of love in his heart. He hated Christians, despised them, couldn't stand Gentiles. And Jesus looked at him and he said, you know what? you're about to undergo a radical makeover because you're going to become a man who loves me desperately. And you're going to become a man who loves Christians. You don't just love Christians. You're going to be one, a dynamic one. And you're going to love Gentiles so much that I'm going to turn you into this juggernaut that goes around the immediate world planting churches among Gentile people. Yeah, that's what you will become. And Paul, it happened, and Paul said this. He says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, and, and I am exhibit A, that that is true. The old life is gone, and new life has begun. And that's possible for each one of us. Now, sometimes you hear these accounts. You go, okay, Peter, yeah, he's, he was a Bible hero. Paul, he's a Bible hero. 
That's, those, those are different kind of people. But what about us? What about ordinary people like us? It's true for you too. There's a lot of people sitting in this room this morning where this transformation is taking place. And you look a lot more like Jesus than you ever did years ago when you first came to him. It's happening in your life. And I want to let somebody tell you about what's happened in his life. A guy named Bill is part of our Parkside family here. He's actually sitting in the room this morning. And here is what Jesus has done in his life to uncover a new man. I'm here with Bill Heeman. Bill and I have been friends for 10 years now since Bill started coming to Parkside and became a part of our Parkside family. And I'd like him to share with you the difference that has made in his life and just um, briefly, how, how did it come about that you came to know Christ in the way that you have here a little later in life? Well, it, it goes back um, about 10, 12 years. Um, my wife Paula was... Um, uh, coming to uh, Parkside, uh, we, uh, I, I decided to join in and then got to know the Lord and then um, felt the need to be born again. And my friend Bart here baptized me uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago now. And uh, this is a story really about what I was like before and what I'm like now uh, walking with the Lord, how it's changed uh, my life. And... Um, uh, good story. I was <clears throat> uh, playing golf with a, a good friend of 35 years and a co-worker. And um, I have to tell you, first of all, that a little bit about myself before, so this makes sense, is um, I was um, very competitive uh, in my young days and my family was competitive. <clears throat> I was in a sales business, which is ultra competitive and not walking with the Lord. When I would play golf, I would uh, drink beer, uh, curse when I did bad, lose my temper, almost, almost to the point of being embarrassing how, how competitive and upset I would get and anger. And uh, so after I was uh, baptized, we were playing around the golf about uh, six years ago or so, and, um, and my buddy s said something to me which allowed me to uh, comment something about what Jesus would do in a case like that and this is now now we're playing golf there's no curse words there's no loss of temper or anything and I say this to him something simple out of the Bible like do unto others as you would have done unto you and he goes who are you and where is the bill that I've known all these years and I said well Greg I'm a new man I'm I've uh, I've been born again and um, trying to lead, you know, be a better person. And uh, so anyway, um, th things developed from there. Uh, we went through a big organizational re uh, change at our company. Uh, there's been a lot of opportunities to get with Greg and pray about things that they would work out. He has since left the company and I have retired from them there. We just spoke today and we prayed together about future events and current events. and. I just want to say it, it, it's just, it just makes you feel great to be able to say that I'm born again and I'm different and the feeling it gives you inside is that you want to share it with people. So I try to, when I'm out in public at a restaurant, if I'm paying my bill at any checkout place, I'll say, have a blessed day and say it with a big smile and everybody just uh, knows that you're with the Lord and, and you never know when just saying have a blessed day will wake up somebody to their heart to the Lord and uh, it's been a huge change in my life and I if anybody out there is thinking of uh, taking that next step with the Lord and being born again and baptized it'll change your life and you'll be smiling till the day you see the Lord and uh, I wish that upon everybody yeah it's thanks great. you're welcome <laughs> that's, that's great. a great story Bill thanks <laughs> all right I love that who are you and what did you do with Bill? <laughs> yeah. What did the Lord do with Bill? He, he did a number on him. And that I know is true of so many of you. And we could probably go around with a microphone and you all could tell a story or many of you could tell a story much like that. It's what Christ does. He doesn't come to affirm us where we are. He comes to give us a new life, a different life. 
He gives us a new mirror in which to understand ourselves as a new person, a new man, a new woman, a good man, a good woman, as only God can make us good and making a wonderful difference in the world. He sees what we can't see. Michelangelo, as he finished a sculptor of an angel, said, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. And that's what God does with us. He looks at us as a big, beautiful chunk of marble. But he looks down inside and he sees what we can't and he sees what we can become. And he sets us free. He sets us free from that old nature, from those old habits, from those old ways of thinking. He forgives us for those things and he sets us free for those things and makes it possible for us to become these new creations that look and act and speak very much like Jesus and are a blessing to the world around us.